Welcome to the One Inside, an internal family systems podcast. I'm your host, Tammy Sollenberger. On today's podcast, I chat with Alicia Rizzo and Robert Fox about having hope with obsessive compulsive disorder. Hey everyone, I hope you're well. As promised, I'm going to make this intro super short. So Alicio and Robert's information is on the show notes. They're both level three IFS therapists. The link to Robert's talk on IFS Talks is there, plus the link to the workshop they're doing, plus links to their websites and my website. Also, I wanted you to know that Robert talks a lot about ERP. And ERP is the standard traditional treatment of OCD, and it stands for exposure and response prevention. It is a type of cognitive behavioral therapy. So we talk about that a little bit. So I wanted you to know what that stands for. I hope everyone's well. I'd love to connect with you on my website, TammySallenberger.com. There's a free shoulding meditation to get to know one of your should parts. You can also connect with me on Twitter, Instagram, in Clubhouse at IFS Tammy and on the One Inside Facebook page. I'm going to end with a quote from Robert. It's actually not a quote. I kind of, I mess with it a little bit, but basically he says, OCD parts need to be a powerful enough distraction to keep you away from intense shame. Enjoy. I get the most messages about OCD. I've gotten several really? messages okay. about can you do a mm-hmm. podcast around OCD? So I'm mm-hmm. super excited about mm-hmm. this conversation. And so why don't That's we start good. with just telling the listeners where you guys are in the world um, yes. and what you see if you look out your window? Let's see. You want to go ahead first? <laughs> yes, I will. Okay. So I'm in London in the UK, but as people will hear from my accent, I'm not British. I'm actually Italian. So... <laughs> Yeah. Um, so if I look outside of my window, I see some blue sky, which is good news here in London, some clouds and some trees. And, you know, a week ago, I was still in Italy, so <laughs> still adjusting to, to, the, to the weather here. You just got back from vacation, which was nice. Yes, I, I have. Well, vacation slash work remotely. <laughs> Ah, what where okay. did you go on vacation? <laughs> well, I'm I'm in Italy, so I went to Italy to see my family. I had a niece who was born during lockdown, so it's like really spending time with family and I had some time off, but I also worked online. So yeah, that was a nice balance. Yeah. They do it properly in Europe, they do it for a month or, or more. Uh, I went there for six weeks. But... <gasps> But of of those, I worked four of them, and I was off for two. So you know, like oh, I didn't really let my clients down (laughs) in that sense. Well, that's like the good and the bad thing about about remote, like working remotely, like having that option. Because when we didn't have that option, we would be like, "Sorry, I'm gone for six weeks, right?" And then or two weeks or one week. But now it's like, "Well, I'm gone for a week, but I could do some work still." So. It's hard mm-hmm. to, it's good, mm-hmm. right? There's good things about it. And some, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Are you feeling refreshed since you're back? Totally. Yes. Really needed that. But, you know, especially, you know, I don't know. I'm, I'm sure you also had lockdown over there, but here we had almost a year in which it was either impossible to leave a country or maybe the country you wanted to go to didn't allow anybody in. Mm-hmm. I had to do some quarantine and stuff. So, you know, it is once you go, it makes sense to stay a bit longer than than a week because you spend the first week <laughs> locked down for quarantine. Oh, wow. Right. Last week I talked with Alessio on video and he looks like jello because he comes back from vacation. He's all nice and loose and everything. I'm sitting there stiff as a board. <laughs> <laughs> because you saw me before. You saw me before the holiday. Yeah. And then you saw me after. So you, you saw the two, two parts of me. The holiday <laughs> me and the I'm like jealous, you know. I love it. And I love that you can tell that in your body, right? Like our body's rigid oh, yeah. as we're like doing all this work. And then, you know, yeah. Maybe, maybe so. 
maybe self energy grows on holiday <laughs> for some reason. Well, I think our managers relax, right? Our managers relax. And then self is more there. So I think self does grow as our managers relax. Yeah, yeah, holiday. exactly. Yes. Mm-hmm. Next mm. podcast, I self-energy on holiday. Tell yes, <laughs> I love it. I'm all about that. I love holiday. Well, the thing that's happening, though, this um, this happened for you guys, too, is we're all sort of shifting, right? It's the week after Labor Day. And holy cow, does everyone now want to like get together about everything that's happening in the fall? It's like everyone's been on vacation or on holiday for the summer. Yeah. And then now it's like, okay, now we have to schedule everything and it all needs to be scheduled right now. I'm like, whoa, wait a minute. Too much. Too much. (laughs) Too much. What about you, Rob? I want to know where you are, but I also want to know if you went went on any holidays this summer. Ah, so I'm in Woburn, Mass., uh, about 35 minutes, 30 minutes north west of Boston. And it's a city of its own, uh, rural, looking out my window, trees, grass, similar stuff. Uh, I live on a cul-de-sac, which is great for my pal here, Gizmo, my dog and close friend who's also part of my practice. And uh, cul-de-sac is great for a dog that barks like crazy. Uh, when I'm not in session. Somehow when I'm in session, he's quiet. He's here right now. He's quiet. Uh, But he knows once we're not doing work, he's a different dog. He's jumping around, making all kinds of noise. So uh, yeah, Woburn here, four months out of the year, good weather. The rest of the time, not so wonderful. (laughs) But you know, like I said, uh, that's a little sounding a little cynical but uh the rest of the year is still good but it's just not i like the warmth it i like a lot of people say they like the warmth so yeah yeah did you get any warmer well we we do have warmer weather in the summer it is beautiful up here but did you go anywhere for holiday and i'm going to start saying Uh, holiday instead of vacation because i think that sounds way more interesting it's a european term holiday all these things i thought so isn't it no I don't know. You'll have to teach me about this. <laughs> oh, I guess. Yeah. So I, we, we got away to New Hampshire. You're in New Hampshire, right, Tammy? I am. Yeah. Yeah. We got away to um, Portsmouth, New Hampshire. Yeah. And... That's where I live. I live in Dover, which is right. By ah, Portsmouth. Right yeah. Yeah. Oh, My yeah. office used to be in Portsmouth. Yeah. No yeah. kidding. Beautiful yeah. town. Great. It is. Lots of stuff to do. Quaint. Go out to eat something on, on the streets and the snow, a band. It was great. My wife and I went there Then we went to, was it Wales? No. Yes. Uh, Maine. Yeah. And, right. Uh, cold water at the beginning <laughs> of the summer. Yeah. But it was great. Yeah. So that was yeah. our, our trip this year. Kind of quiet given, you know, what's been going on with COVID. Yeah. 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 So I thought maybe we could start with just telling everybody what brought both of you, like maybe you both could share about what, what brought both of you to have such interest in OCD and, um, and wanting to do this workshop that you have coming up and just have the specialty that you both have. Mm -hmm. Sure. Well, it's okay to go ahead, Alessio. Um, So I've had OCD since I was a child. And uh, it was around the age of 21 that I got diagnosed by a psychiatrist uh, over the phone, (laughs) he told me. Uh, Not sure why he chose that, but he did. And uh, I received the pretty standard care that most people get for OCD, which is exposure response prevention, along with medication, but I, I did suffer throughout college and not until after college did I start getting some treatment. Uh, however, it wasn't until about uh, 11 years ago that I really um, started using or receiving IFS and some EMDR that really was transformative in my life. And my big desire is to get out to the world what I discovered through the help of Dick Schwartz IFS and also some EMDR. Because uh, while ERP is evidence-based, I think there's a lot that can be offered uh, with these models that we have now in a way that I think is less painful since ERP can be pretty tough at times. So that's my goal is to get it out there 
And uh, I met Alessio. What is it? How long ago did we meet? About uh, six months? It was a months? few months ago. Yeah. Yeah. Less? Okay. He heard my six podcast. Six months ago, yeah. Yeah. I did. He heard my other podcast on IFS Talks, and he contacted me and said, I've been working with OCD using IFS, and ever since then, we've been friends, and we meet up and talk and come up with ideas, and uh, that's what brings us here. Alessio, you want to add? Yes, yes. Um, so my... <laughs> My road was different, and I was talking to Rob a couple of weeks ago. He asked me, so, did you have OCD? And I said, I kind of paused, and I said, let, let me double check this. Why am I so into OCD? Because I don't have a diagnosis, but I had quite an, like something that doesn't have a name, like some psychosomatic problem since I was very young which is what brought me to therapy. And this, when I was still in Italy and I, I was almost like, feels like my previous life, I was studying engineering in Italy and then I ended up being a psychotherapist. <laughs> you see, <laughs> wrong choices in life. <laughs> um, but, but yeah, I mean, then my, my encounter with OCD was almost like the universe brought it to me. I was uh, doing my psychotherapy training here in the UK I go to my placement when you've just learned how to reflect back what the, what the clients tell you and I have maybe this was like a charity for LGBTQ people and they usually would charge like five ten pounds I don't know how many dollars would that be twenty dollars <laughs> For a session, but then here comes this high paying client. He was paying 50 pounds and he was come with severe OCD. And all I could do was reflect back for three, four sessions. And then, of course, mm. it didn't go anywhere. Right. And, and so that's that was my first, uh, you know, taste of psychotherapy from the therapeutic chair. And since then, I have attracted people with OCD, clients with OCD experience, and have become very curious, started to read about it, to find the main literature that's available is CBT-based, so you would find exposure response, some sort of cognitive approach. And they tried it and didn't really work that much. And then I met IFS and then things started to change and I went to level one, level two, level three, asking to teachers, PAs, do you know anybody who does mm. OCD with IFS? No one knew anybody. And at least at some point, my supervisor told me, oh, have you heard about Robert Fox? I said, no, let me listen to the podcast. And an hour after the podcast, I sent him an email saying, that's what I've been discovering that you know whenever I speak to people they tell me oh Alessio what you found out about OCD we haven't heard it anywhere you should kind of publish something so I kind of knew I had something and I really needed someone else to discuss this with so I'm so happy that Robert replied to my emails because he must be yeah. receiving thousands I'm so glad of them. You, I'm so glad you reached out it was really great and yeah. uh, you know, to find somebody who was doing the work. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Yes. And then by studying IFS, I think I realized I did have some mild form of OCD. That it was undiagnosed, but the structure is there. So, yeah, that's that's so how I got together. here. Yeah, <laughs> yes. so glad you're here. Yeah, me too. Yeah. I'm so glad you guys got connected. So yeah. two questions that come up for me first off is why do you think sort of in IFS, if we sort of in IFS language, why do you think um, all these other treatment modalities don't work with OCD? Well, they, I wouldn't say they don't work. Um, I would say ERP is effective. It's evidence-based. 
but uh, for one, uh, I don't think they bring the curiosity that IFS brings that's so necessary. Um, you know, when I saw an ERP uh, clinician, the obsessions were labeled as this is obsessive and we just put them over here and we'll just call them obsessive. But there wasn't that curiosity as to what brings these on. It's more like, well, we're going to have you be exposed to that source of anxiety and eventually you habituate to the anxiety and hope that it comes down. Um, and it's very painful work as many know who have either done it or can imagine doing it. Uh, uh, and it, it never really worked very well for me. I listened to loop tapes. I listened to, uh, you know, putting hands in your hair, and letting you sit with that anxiety. It's very painful if you have any kind of contamination OCD. For me, the type of OCD I had was called relationship OCD. So, you know, fears of, is this the right one? How do I know? And then obsessing about that. And um, so I love, what I love about IFS is that it's just so um, curious and compassionate towards what brings on these parts that are extreme. Uh, let's say you want to add? Yeah. So I want to comment on the um, other ways that OCD is treated, which is usually through some cognitive um, reformulation. So there's like a lot of labeling and telling, oh, that's an obsession, don't engage and then that. And when I read about IFS, it gave, it gave me a language to describe what, in my opinion, this approach is doing, which is it's creating a manager part that manages the OCD. So from a purely theoretical point of view, I couldn't see, I could see that there could be some improvement. I could see how evidence-based treatments that measure that kind of improvement can produce data that says, yes, it's effective because if we create a good enough manager, short-term, medium-term, it can cause an improvement. At the same time, it's creating a manager. And some, for some people, this might be doable, might be okay, it might be what they need. For some others, might not. And to me, the IFS model offers a very different approach. It says, let's bring self in. Let's not create another manager. And it makes a lot of sense too. And I think that why it would feel good because the new manager, even though it's a manager, that feels better than what's been running the system. And so it's mm -hmm. like, okay, that feels like some improvement because the new manager feels feels better. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Uh, however, I found that when I had some improvements with ERP, if I didn't continue the ERP, then the issues would start to slide back. Uh, with IFS, I feel that when burdens are truly healed, witnessed, healed, unburdened, then there isn't this, you know, force that's driving these parts to be extreme. Uh, so it's really better for longevity in terms of true healing, in my opinion. And that was the case with uh, my experiences of healing, that when I had unburdenings, I mean, it was phenomenal. I'm so curious about the idea of, you said, Alessio, that the framework was there when you're talking about yourself. You said there was, I wasn't sure that I had OCD, but I'm looking back, there was a framework that was in place. Can you tell me a little bit about that and what you mean by that? Well, I think this comes from, not from strictly from IFS. I, I read a book on OCD, which is the only one that really opened my eyes and it's I don't know if I can make the name is not IFS specific uh, Tammy can I name the book so it's by f someone called Fred Penzel and um, you know the treatment is mainly CBT based but the uh, the 
the first chapters of the book describe the whole OCD experience, it talks about the spectrum, and he puts the whole, even, um, um, now I have the words in English are not coming up, the eating disorders um, as part of, of, of OCD, he puts body dysphoria, which is similar to what I had experienced. And to me, the you know the key is in the wording, right? Obsessive, compulsive. You know, as soon as there is an obsession and the compulsion, which is already part work, right? It's already part language there. Then we have case for OCD and. And I think it's it, it's a pattern that exists in many situations. So this work that we're doing, the Rob and I are doing, I think, is great not just for OCD, for for, for any situation in which there is the, this very linked impulse response. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I find that there are some real over time. I've seen several factors that are pretty consistent with clients including myself but i don't want to speak for everyone because we have to listen to each person's particular situation but in general what i found is that there usually is repressed anger that there wasn't a, a parent or other figure that could hold that anger and allow it to be heard and witnessed and there also tends to be a lot of shame, and it comes in two parts. Shame that was in some manner, uh, typically during the formative years, um, that was really intense shame that really gets dissociated quite a bit uh, because we have parts that go forward in our lives and don't want to look back at it. We, we push it down. But then there's shame that comes from having the OCD itself, because once you start having these obsessions and compulsions and your family knows about it, and if you have a family that, that isn't, I had a family that, you know, at first they weren't, you know, there's a lot of sarcasm in my family. That was the way they dealt with it. So there became shame from having the condition itself. So two forms of shame, at least in my situation. So, yeah, I wanted to add that. Yeah, and I, I wanted to comment on shame. Thank you, Rob, for naming it, because I come from being gay. I come from a very ashamed culture. I don't know how we got the word minority. Um, and so sometimes shame is almost impossible to dodge and to avoid. You just grow with it. It becomes your bread. <laughs> you have it every day. And and yeah, I agree. Shame and anger, and again, I can only comment on the on what I've seen on the small cases of people I have the kind of honor to to meet in my consultative room. But there is an element of neglect that is added mm -hmm. to that. That you know, you have this shame in you. You don't know what to do. You exile it, and then it turns into something else that maybe we can talk, call OCD and and you get more shame so yeah yeah we've got a yeah. recipe for trauma well guilt has a purpose it leads us to do a certain behavior to change something make do something like repair a relationship tear shame really doesn't have except uh, you know, when we're early, young, shame helps us stop us in our tracks if there's a potential for hurting as a child, another child in some way. Uh, the mother says, don't run with scissors or something like that. Okay, so we stop in our tracks. And then the, ideally, the parent says, you know, I just want you not to get hurt. And there's a repair. But when a child is left in that shame and it's not repaired, it's not resolved, then it starts to get problematic. We're not looking to blame parents here. That's not the point of all this. It's just to you know through research how shame can get toxic when it's left on, on it's not resolved. There's no reparation for the shame. 
Yeah, I was thinking there's no repair, right? Like yeah. there's, there's no repair. Um, one of the things I think is really interesting that you're saying is that there's been this, um, you can see these common ingredients, exiles, like maybe themes of exiles. That's what it sounds like you're saying is sort of you're seeing these common themes and the exiles that then create these protectors, the O part, like yeah. group, probably like a grouping of O parts and then a grouping of C parts. Right. They're shaking your head. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Sessions and compulsive parts. Yes. 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 Yeah. 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 I, I want to add something to this and it links to the shame. The fact, to, to me, one of the features of shame is that it's something that we need to hide. You know, when we're ashamed, the first thing we do, I'm going to hide whatever I'm ashamed of and pretend it doesn't exist. So that makes it even harder for whoever the carer is to even see it. So their parents mm. they might have had an ashamed child forever and the child has succeeded or the protector of the child has succeeded into never showing that that happened. But then that nests inside, right? And it creates a whole psychic structure around it. And the common theme is that many people with OCD are used, we're used to the idea that, let me restart. So we're used to the idea that the traumatic experiences are these big, big events, right? I'm gonna, I was hit by a car. I was, I don't know, something very bad happened to me. So we have that one specific event. Many people who suffer from OCD experiences don't have that because it's almost an invisible occurrence of, problematic situations that accumulate and all of a sudden they realize they have something that has a name of OCD but they cannot point at anything mm. and that's also part of the mm. suffering of the, the, that exists mm -hmm. ah, right and I've seen that in clients right that there is this added suffering of why am I like this bad yeah. which I'm putting in quotes like nothing mm -hmm. bad yeah. like nothing bad or I'm not aware of something and so OCD also, also seems like one of those really hard to treat illnesses, right? So mm. why do I have this really hard to treat thing and I don't have like something comparable to it? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, there would be shame about obsessing about things that I thought were silly to obsess about. Like uh, I'll, I'll get into a little detail, maybe too much information here, but you know, never, I, never. <laughs> I, I'm Jewish. And I remember I, I would go to my mother and said, you know, I was in the synagogue and the restroom and I missed the toilet when I peed to the urinal. Right. And uh, mom, should I go clean it up? I can't stop thinking about whether I, you know, it's there and I made a mistake. And my mother's like, oh, you know, whatever you need to do, if you feel like it would be helpful, then go ahead, clean up. But you don't have to, you know. I'm like, yeah, but I would talk to her over and over again, confessing that, you know, I did this thing I missed, you know. And she's like, it's not a big deal. And I'd be like, well, and, you know, drive my parents bananas at talking about it 50 times that night, you know. Mm -hmm. Those are things that typically wouldn't be a big issue for a lot of people. They, I miss the urinal and they say, you know, <laughs> that's what happens, you know? So, uh, but for, for me, I would clung to it. Those kind mm -hmm. of obsessions or compulsions, you know, thoughts, it, you know, and then we develop embarrassment about it. Why can't I let it go? Why can't I let mm -hmm. it go? Yeah. Yeah. And then, you know. Yeah. So the, the mom in me wants to ask, what would have been a good thing for your mom to do? Like now looking back, like what do you think would have been a good thing for her to do to help you with that? I think my mom actually handled it fairly well. It's just that uh, she said, you know, if it's bothersome to you, she could have said, mm, good question. It's a good question, <laughs> you know? I think my parents, in many ways, did many things well. Uh, however, there is, you know, through therapy, I, I, I didn't realize this until I was in IFS therapy, that what I don't think they did well, uh, their, their intent was good. My, my parents' intent was, and most parents' intent 
is good. We know that about parts. Parts have good intention. The outcome isn't always good, but the intent comes from a well-intentioned part. Yeah. So my parents allowed a lot of sarcasm for my, I'm, I'm the middle of three boys, no girls. And um, my, my brother, my older brother was very sarcastic. Um, a lot of jokes where I was the focus of those jokes in a sarcastic way. My younger brother was more soft-spoken and would kind of go along with it, but he was not really the instigator of those jokes. And when that sarcasm was going on, where my brother focused on me and, you know, my idiosyncrasies or whatever, um, my parents didn't really intervene and stop it. And we're not talking about just one time, it went on for years and years. So what my parents should have done in this case is say to my brother, Mike, that's not okay. We don't do that here in this family. Um, and so I never got the message that there was a parent to step in. So, you know, with regards to the toilet thing, eh, I'm not quite sure. But in regards to this example of sarcasm where it was chronic, um, that's when they should have intervened. That I would have had a sense someone, an adult here is here to make sure this doesn't continue. Um, because my parents, their intent was for me to roll with the humor because my sense is they wanted me to be strong so that if I faced kidding in the outside world, you know, if there were kids that were bullies or that were taunting me in any way, that I would roll with it. That, that's my sense of the positive intent. But what happened was I developed shame around things because of the sarcasm. So if my parents are listening at some point on this podcast, I want them to know, I know they had positive intent. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. I wish they had done it differently. That's all. Yeah. Yeah. Because, you know, parents, they do what they think is the right thing at the time. Yeah. You know? Alicia, what's coming up for you as Rob is talking about this example? Well, a lot of compassion to start with. Very touched by the mm, thanks. The, mm. you know, mm. Thank you. What he shared, yes. Mm. Well, a lot of similarities, to be honest. The, in in the you know, I didn't have a brother who would um, be sarcastic towards me, but the world was enough to point the finger at the <laughs> gay boy, <laughs> like right. <laughs> And the, 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 you know, the same kind of attitude, you know, it's kind of weird. We come from totally different places in the world, yet, yet the intention was the same. Just, just you go ahead, you go on, you don't need any help. You will kind of toughen up. And it just became like, well, I'm not tough enough. <laughs> so I just have to hide this and pretend yeah. it's not it's not happened and then it remains in you. And I, I, had, I have a metaphor that it comes from a way that we say in Italian and it's, it, it doesn't have a translation in the English language, but it says basically that a drop of water, if it drops continuously on a rock, it kind of creates a very deep hole. So sometimes like in terms of trauma, sometimes we imagine trauma as a hit that destroys. Acute, yeah. If you have just a, an innocent drop of water that drops on the same spot on a very mm. hard surface over and over again, it disintegrates mm. more than a one hit. Um, that's a great analogy. So that yeah. it, it wears, it takes the person out of being themselves. Yeah. Yeah. And if the parent is looking at the drop, it's, a, it's just a drop. What? what damage can he do? He's tough enough. He's a rock. But then mm. it, it, mm, it, that's beautiful. it kind it's of true. consumes you inside. And that's, mm. that, it's interesting. It brings up parts of me, Alessio and Tammy, mm. that, you know, I think of Alessio, what you face, which is perhaps discrimination because, you know, mm -hmm. of identifying as gay. 
And I'm thinking I have a part that says, well, you know, this, it was just my brothers being sarcastic. What's the big deal? Mm -hmm. it, was, it was my family. I didn't face really, you know, this taunting on the outside. But then when I heard your analogy about the rock and this slow drop, gradually, mm -hmm. it, where it wore away at my self-esteem. I had, yes, I had other things that happened in my life, but when I think of that situation, it's actually very validating what you just said. And I, it's a beautiful, I appreciate that, Alessio. Thank you. I mean, I think it applies to lots of situations. That's not mine uniquely, but. And so do you think that, what do you think is unique about that? Like with the OCD or the parts, like the obsessive parts and the compulsive parts, like this is kind of a weird question, but mm. like how do you think or sort of why do you think those protect? I'm guessing those are protective parts. What do you think happens that they become formed? Like with, with the anger and the shame and then the, like having to hide that. Mm -hmm. What about that makes makes it unique? I'm like, I hope you understand what I'm asking. So I don't think yeah. I'm asking, like, asking it. Like, what do you think about that makes it so unique that these types of protectors get um, formed? I think that's what I'm saying. Well, I think when we don't have a way to process these feelings because there's not enough of a parent or self-energy present, um, and we have a sense of overwhelm. What causes trauma when we feel overwhelmed? We feel helpless. You know, when we when we hear about clients who have addictions of any kind, and I consider it a type of an addiction in a way, OCD. Uh, it's a form of it. When there's a sense of overwhelming helplessness with a certain feeling. Um, these obsessions and compulsions are parts that come in to actually help us stay so focused on something else than being with the feeling of overwhelm. Yes, it's a harsh way of being distracted with something else. You know, uh, sometimes parts of me wonder if I should say this, but we don't get a hit of a positive drug or something. Not that I wish that on anybody uh, in terms of an addiction. But we don't get a pleasurable thing. An obsession or compulsion is painful, but it is effectively taking us away from focusing on a much larger in the background feeling of whether it be shame or what have you. If I'm so focused on I've got to get home, this is a real example, I'm at work, this is in the last 10 years, and I worry about the gasoline on the lawnmower overflowing somehow in my mind, and it's going to blow up the house. Well, that certainly is going to be so powerful enough to take me away from thinking about something else that I might feel shameful or worried about in terms of performance at work or what have you. So it has to be powerful enough to totally hijack my mind. Yeah. Otherwise, if it's not powerful enough, it's not going to do the job. Yeah. So yeah. I don't know if that. Makes yeah, that's ex yeah, that's exactly what I was. That was exactly the answer that I wanted. <laughs> okay. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Sure. Yeah. Alessio, did you want to add or thoughts or? And just just a little bit. Um, I went I went back to the whole to how the whole thing forms, and again. I don't think the obsession comes all at once. It's all very gradual and it's all very lonely. You know, you, you are in your inner world and these things hurt you inside and you slowly start to, I think that's how, I don't remember, don't know that, but that's coming up for me now. Like, I don't think managers develop in that way straight away. They kind of try different things and, little by little you you understand oh if if i think about that thing that's kind of strong enough to upset me so that i don't think of the other one and it might be something one day and something the other day and after a while you kind of choose your favorite so the managers know that oh if that's what i think about i do my job more efficiently and it, it all happens in silence, in an inner world that no one knows of, that, you know, it goes on for years and years. And at some point, it becomes a whole subsystem of parts that have their own life. 
Yeah, that's great. Right. Just like the water on the rock. Right. So the water Ooh. is slow and, and then we wear it. Now we've got this big hole in the rock and we're like, how did we get this big hole in the rock? Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah, exactly. exactly. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Tell me about this workshop, you guys. I have two two big kind of questions that I want to make sure we cover. One is I want to hear about the workshop you guys are doing and let people know about that and give us like a big teaser. And then I also want to talk about this idea of the work you guys are doing or thinking about doing to make IFS and OCD evidence based. Like, mm -hmm. yeah. So those are sort of the two things I'd, I'd like to talk about. Yes, so we are offering a workshop in late November. Uh, Alessia and I will be doing with IFS Spain or Barcelona specifically. It'll be about four hours in length. It is being translated um, uh, um, Spanish English. Uh, translator will be available. And we're going to cover uh, how we work specifically with OCD using IFS. Um, I add in there sometimes I do some EMDR, but mostly IFS. Um, Alessia, you want to add in more details about the specifics? Uh, it's an ESAT day and it's going to be online. So, you know, people from all over the world can, um, can attend both Spanish and English. We will speak in English, but we'll have a Spanish translator and, and yeah, it's, it's both. Rob and I have compared our notes, our clinical ideas. We put to the mainly they kind of even if we come from different perspectives, they kind of converge into quite of a coherent structure. But we will present kind of some things together and some things. Oh, that's what unless you see that's what Rob sees here. So the attendees can take away what what might work for them best. And there will also be some experiential parts, where, I don't know, part in the third sections of the, of the yeah. workshop so people can experience um, and explore their own system because probably people who are attracted to that work might have experiences on the OCD spectrum. That's great. So it's, it's the 27th of November. November, and yes. November, and then um, where can people sign up for that? So there is a website that um, I believe, Tammy, you said you will be adding to this podcast um, those links, and we'll make that available. Great. Right. Yeah. Um, we also will have some live, um, well, live recordings, recordings of some actual sessions. Uh, Great. Okay where uh, I, I did some work with somebody with OCD. Uh, we may do some role playing, uh, all that, yeah. Right, okay, so I'll put those links in the show notes for people so they can click on them. Um, and then to tell me about, both of you sound like you're both interested in doing writing and um, making this evidence base. So tell me about that and even that process. Sure. Um, yeah, it's important to get it evidence based so that uh, it's used all over the world. Uh, that's my goal, and I'm sure Alessio's as well, right? How we go about that? Well, we're working on that, uh, getting the attention of the right people. But that will, of course, involve getting participants and the usual research stuff. Um, so that's early in the process right now. We haven't. We, we put some word out there. Leslie, you want to add to that? Yeah, well, first, first of all, thank you, Tammy, for inviting us to this because, absolutely, you know, one of the biggest um, points of action that Rob and I have is to get the ball rolling, to make sure that people start talking about OCD and start requesting these kind of discussions, podcasts, and workshops so that you know we would we are starting to put together some case studies something to kind of initiate this process because there is so little there's really so little written about ocd and yet so many people suffer from it 
that I, I don't know why that's happened. And uh, so, yeah, I mean, clinical studies or people who just want to discuss, I'm very open to people contacting me through my website if they want to, um, to contribute to this. It's just so important for the community that, yeah. And I want to get more people Most, trained. I'm sorry, I interrupted. Yeah. And then I, I, I was kind of lost in words because it's so important this, that. Yeah, that's, that's the message. I don't have more words. Yeah. Just yeah. wake up all, <laughs> come join, yeah. join yeah. the conversation, yes. I mean, we're both contacted by people from all over the world. At least I'll speak for my parts that it's frustrating because of here in the U.S., uh, licensure restrictions about where I can, I've been contacted by people all over and I, uh, and they say, I don't, I want to do something other than ERP and I want to share with them what's helped me. And uh, I have to say, you know, I I can't sometimes do that because, um, you know, I have to make sure I'm operating under my license properly. Yeah. Uh, You know, it's a gray area. Some people do those things and I, yeah. You know. Yeah, but uh, uh, for example, we don't have the same licensing restrictions here in the UK. Yet, it's me. How many clients can I take? Right. You know. Right. Right. So I, I was, I was thinking now. You know, even if people who are listening and cannot make it to the workshop, or maybe it's not the right moment for them. But you know, hopefully, Robin, I thinking about creating supervision sorry consultation groups or any form of mm-hmm. discussion because i think what needs to happen is that people start to get trained and we form some sort of group of people who can kind of grow the offer that ifs mm-hmm. can give to there is so many people who don't have access to ifs therapy right now yeah well it sounds like you guys two things that's coming up for me. I feel like you're saying there's so much, it it will reduce the shame, right? There's so much shame about this, this illness that that people can't even get treated. Right. So it's, if there's more like, okay, here, here's either books or groups, or here's all these resources, then that might help even reduce some of the shames that there isn't because the shame is actually making it worse, making those parts worse, Mm -hmm. right? The shame that, that, Mm-hmm. That exile, right, is making those protectors worse, which I'm putting in quote, air quotes. Or more extreme. The more extreme, yeah. And I'm like, yeah. my language is yeah, yeah. Using, that's okay. using the right language. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. Yeah. <laughs> bad protectors, bad, bad. <laughs> Thank you, Tommy, for bringing this up, because this is something that um, I see a lot of in my practice. The majority of people who come to me have already done some therapy for OCD and it's usually not been that effective hence yeah. they're returning and let's not forget that Google exists people are bombarded by a lot of media coverage on mental health and you know tips and and they usually end up trying very hard what these articles say they're usually inspired by more cognitive approaches they might do it on their own without clinical help and that might add to the shame because they come saying i have tried this i have failed on my own with the therapist with another one through the national health system through insurance so the all of that adds to what we have and even like i write articles on my website that are free for everybody to access. I mean, I've got these lexi parts that tell me don't publish them, but I said I'd rather put it out there and people can tell me there is a mistake that I'm very happy to correct it. Yes, I love it, yes. But at least least people can find something that isn't just the usual, do these 10 tips, breathe that way. And because sometimes I've got parts that kind of really can bad mouth those kind of, media Uh, but yeah if there is more good quality content out there can really help people to at least have some hope and think oh well that's a method that actually has a different perspective 
it's growing and there are people trained in this that can provide it and it cannot just be two of us <laughs> right yeah. Go ahead, Maybe i want to add it's, i think it's yeah. important and this is with all due respect to all other very well trained some very senior ifs therapists is that ocd to treat can be very challenging as i'm sure most people can attest to yeah. um and even the most when i provide a consultation to other ifs therapists um they either have previously been trained in erp so if they start to you know, run into any kind of difficulties they may revert sometimes back to their older methods of erp or patience is so important with ocd because it's not unusual and i don't want to speak for anyone in particular but it's not unusual to start to start to get frustrated when there's so many layers of protectors um you know dick worked with me and he had to peel back slowly each protector with permission of course and there'd be a lot of resistance and that challenges even the most senior ifs there. there's so many layers that it takes time and i know my own ifs therapist i've been with 10 years you know i still have these layers and layers and he has to work with it very methodically so it takes time and patience and i just want those therapists when i talk to them and consultation i say yeah be good to yourself it's it's not easy <laughs> not easy yeah that's that that's helpful I, yeah i think that's really helpful and maybe that's part of what happens is then why there's only two of you which i'm sure there's not just two of you but there's only right. two of you now being like ocd and ifs let's go and i right. think that probably speaks to like so many therapists including me yeah. are like uh, it's so frustrating and there's it's there's so much yeah. you know hopelessness around it the client's yeah. hopelessness and then my hopelessness and so then you know we want to quit really, or i quit right but we want to really be clear that there is definitely hope yeah. uh, oh, and yeah. i'm not saying you are saying that it's just that well you know what i'm saying right yeah there's, no. a, there's a lot of hope for this like there's stuff that can be done i we're both excited about what we see when we get to know those protectors and yeah yeah that's great yeah. um so how does is there, do you guys want to say anything else before i ask you my last question to end on like a fun note like, um, um i had something but it's gone <laughs> if it comes back was, that's fine the, well there is something that actually even forgot to mention earlier one of my other dreams is to bring ifs to italy because mm. there isn't anything in Italian. And so, again, Italian speakers reach out. That's yeah, great. That's great. That's great. Yes. I, I had a little story I wanted to share. But oh. did you want to say more about Italy first or what you were just sharing? No, before? no, that's it. It's a very okay. early stage. Of care. So an interesting story is when I was in graduate school, I really had this passion for uh, mental health and doing work. and. I was uncertain, which is a hallmark of a lot of OCD is this doubt. I don't know if I want to do this. Should I do this? Maybe I shouldn't. Maybe I should. Which one do I choose when it comes to buying something? But in graduate school, even though I was there and I really had this part that was pretty certain early on that I wanted to go forward, there was this fear. And one of the fears was, uh, and I've never shared this before, was what if I'm working with clients and they get out of control and physically hurt me, you know, someone who's in the hospital. And I obsessed about this. I thought, well, you know, boy, then I'd be physically hurt and I'd regret it. And so I obsessed about this. And I finally went to a graduate professor and, of mine who I admired. Uh, and I said, well, what should I do? I'm grappling with this. And she said in two words, don't do it. Don't do it. Don't go forward. And I said, that's it. I worked up all this courage to ask you whether I should go forward. And I've been, and she goes, no, yeah, just don't do it. And I said, I was expecting, I didn't say this out loud to her, this, you know, big 
speech about how you have to face your fears. You know, it's kind of like ERP, right? Face your fears, right? Go towards, lean into it. No, just don't do it. Well, here I am. I'm 100% glad that I did go forward. Do you think she was like doing like a paradoxical, like do you think she was purposely doing that? I know her personality. She kind of is. No, I don't think she was. I think she was just like, I don't know what to tell you. (laughs) Wow. Wow. Yeah. yeah. But anyway, I'm 100% glad. It's It's funny that story, that story really sticks with you though, right? Like that story is like. It does. I was tortured. I was, I spent years thinking about, do I go towards something that's passion of mine? How could I give up on this? You know, I just want to illustrate how painful OCD can be where it's, you know, tormenting where you spend hours and days and thinking about whether I should make this decision or that. And we seek reassurance. We think it's going to help because the reassurance, you know, gives a hit of, oh, someone agrees. Uh, It feels good. And I used to seek out my friends and my family to get reassurance. And then it actually breathes it, it does give a bit of like uh, probably a dose of dopamine for a moment. And then boom, it's like breathing oxygen into a fire. The obsessions start and you start thinking, well, no, what if I don't go that way? I think that they're wrong. Uh, it, you know, it's tormenting, but, um, mm-hmm. but there is a way in IFS. If we listen to each of these parts, parts that feel like they want to do it this way or parts that don't want to do it. And we really listened. That was my first experience when I went to my IFS therapist was he really showed an interest in listening to each of these parts. When I went to previous therapists who were ERP trained, they'd say, okay, enough of that. (laughs) Uh, You know, let's label it. It's obsessive. And we're going to put it over here. Whereas when I went to my IFS therapist, he's like, let's separate what the pros and the cons are and really listen to what you feel that was refreshing mm, it's that curiosity right that curiosity and that yeah. friending and yeah. almost it sounded like those parts that had been exiled for so long were able to really oh. have a voice yeah yeah now the myth is that i would go on and on right. with talking about each side but when i really allowed my parts to be when he allowed my parts to be heard and they were witnessed in a way that felt um, truly, truly witnessed. Um, It's not what people think. It actually wasn't just back and forth forever. It was like, I could, I could, when there's self energy with it, that's what makes the difference. Yeah. And, And you're saying too, like you said earlier about having that adult Right. Like sort of the, so your therapist was that adult, was that self for those parts? I I borrowed his self. Yeah. Because mine was obscured by parts. And then when my parts uh, were able to take, myself was able to take over. uh, Myself was always there, of course, as we know with IFS. It's just that it was obscured by these extreme parts. It was like the sun behind the moon, you know, sun behind clouds. Yeah. Yeah. Great. So thanks. Great. I just wanted to share that. Yeah. No, that's great. Thank you. Yeah. And that go ahead. just the yeah, thing go that got back to my mind, which actually yeah. follows on what Rob said. It's I'm reading Frank Anderson's book. And good one, yeah. What he describes when dealing with especially some DID processes, the kind of difficulties that those parts can present are really speak to me really it's where i see in the work so there is hope there and it is starting to you know even some literature on it exists now so it's encouraging to have anderson book who is a good starting point for dealing with very challenging parts or managers if challenging is even the right word just challenging for the therapists (laughs) yeah right right (laughs) right well and I think that's the other hope thing the hope hope marcheting is that IFS looks at these illnesses in air quotes so differently which just in the in and of itself gives us hope right if I look at OCD so differently 
you know, these are parts and they're in the protective roles and they're extreme roles. And it, it, and so we have that frame that, that itself gives us so much hope. Yeah. That yeah. parts are extreme because something in the past was extreme. <laughs> it was extreme shaming. So parts come to protect that. Yeah. That's great. <laughs> Yeah. So why don't we end with both of you telling if you had to do something different and you have to do something different in your life, what would you do? Go ahead, Alessio. You go for it. I go first on this one. Okay. So <laughs> other ones I'll go first, but that's just... <laughs> no, no, no. I'll go. I'll go. I'll go. I'll go. I'll go. I'm, me, I'm, me, it's me. Really come, it's already coming out. Um, so two things I would do. First, I'd be a dancer which is something I wanted to do, but I think my body is getting like, no, 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 no. Awesome. But who knows? I'm going to just go to a dance class tomorrow. Yes. Yes. I love and it. I love it. The other one, I'd be a shaman. I'd like to explore that mm. spiritual aspect. And I was listening to Greater Than the uh, Some of Our Parts by Dick Schwartz, and he names shamanism. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, well, maybe actually <laughs> I'm That's doing cool. it. <laughs> yeah. to be a shaman dancer i think there's a, some sort of way you can and you know, in the integrate. meantime i do ifs therapy <laughs> yeah yeah i love it what about you rob i've always wanted to be an actor uh and uh when i've done role plays you know in in, in trainings or <clears throat> i've done uh i went out to a treatment facility out in Arizona when they invited professionals out to view the facility and they did psychodrama. I never done that. I just loved it. Like I get into the role and people always ask me like, is that your life? And I say, no, I'm role playing. You know, sometimes it's my life. Yes. There's no doubt. <laughs> right. No doubt. Right. There's sometimes it's really my life, but other times I'm like doing a total role and people are like, geez, man, what's going on? And I'm like, no, come on. I'm just role playing. But yeah, I love it. Yeah. I'm having fun. I love it. Yeah. So yeah, actor. I love it. Well, thank you guys so much. Um, any last words or anything, you know, anything you want the one, one last thing you want the listeners to know. That you look like you're doing an awesome job as a mother, because I noticed you're juggling a dog and a kid and your husband. It's like, you're doing a podcast. Like how many things that's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> thanks <laughs> i have lots of good manager parts <laughs> yeah and you did it so well too oh thanks rob i really appreciate that, I mean that. yeah i just uh, feel very welcome here thank you for Aww. doing this and bless thank you. you well i echo thank you tammy for organizing this for inviting me and rob and and yes i think I think just talking together, it's what's really emerged for me is the importance of hope, that there is hope there. And the fact that this podcast exists, that every person who listens to it and maybe shares it even in their own mind or with one friend would really spread the wave of hope. I think that's, that's great. It's exciting times. Yeah. Thanks for hanging out today. If you like this episode, make sure you subscribe. And if you really like this episode, share it with a friend and leave a review. You can follow me on Instagram at IFS Tammy and join our community on Facebook at the One Inside Podcast. Talk to you next time.